Hello and welcome to Let's Talk with Bishop R.C. Blakes. R.C. is an author, empowerment teacher and the proud pastor of the New Home Ministries of New Orleans, Louisiana and Houston, Texas. His message circles the globe. His conversational and candid approach to challenging content makes him a relevant voice to all generations. Get ready for a life-changing transformational conversation. Recently, I was in a situation where I was challenged uh, to break one of my, I guess, cardinal rules. And that is, you never really respond to negativity. Whenever you see eagles and pigeons fighting, trust me, the, the pigeon did not ascend to the mountain peak where the eagle lives, the eagle had to come down. So one of my rules is that, you know, I try my best never to respond to negativity. Sometimes I fall off the wagon and I have to say something, but I guess that I guess that's just human. But on this particular occasion, I, I struggled with it because someone was berating me for embracing a person, just embracing them lovingly and politely and kindly, uh, embracing them um, like Christ would. And you know, how, how can you be a Christian and and uh, shake hands or, or hug or embrace this person when you know they don't believe in Jesus Christ? And I stopped for a minute. I got angry and I started to say some things, but I didn't. And then I began to ponder on how immense the ignorance must be in this individual. This person is like the people Jesus talked about, the, the Pharisees who searched the scripture and they thought they had salvation, but they had no clue. Because the reality is, I embrace people for a few reasons. Number one, I love people of all kinds. I love those that I agree with. I love those that I don't agree with. Number two is, I have a mission, a God-given mission. The Bible says, he that wins souls is wise. And the last time I checked, if a fisherman is going to catch fish, he has to go and put himself in the environment of the fish. And then it just comes naturally to me when Christ lives in my heart, when his whole mission is to seek and to save that which was lost. Also, I am evolved enough as a Christian to understand that I can relate to people on levels other than spiritual or religious. There are people who have another faith, who have a, a lot to say about things relative to sports. They have a lot to say about things relative to politics, maybe my brand of politics. They, they have a lot to say about things relative to the economy. And so I want to talk today because I think we need it in the body of Christ. I want to talk about tolerance. Now, I looked for a definition, and the definition says that tolerance is it is the ability or willingness to tolerate something in particular, the existence of opinions or behavior that one does not necessarily agree with. Now, if there ever were a time that we need tolerance. Certainly it is today to be saved and to be committed to the principles of the Bible. It takes a lot of tolerance to live in the United States of America. 
it does. And I see a lot of Christians struggling with people of different beliefs and people that are living their lives in different ways other than the scriptures outline. And you're struggling. But the religious persuasion, listen to this very carefully. The religious persuasion, the religious persuasion of Christianity is that we must be in a posture where we condemn others to prove our conviction to God's truth. So if if I'm embracing uh, a Muslim, not their faith, not their doctrine, but them as an individual, you see, we've lost our ability to compartmentalize and understand that there's a difference between the person and their religion. There's a difference between the person and their lifestyle. There's a difference between the person and, you know, whatever. The religious Christian persuasion is that for me to be proper, I must condemn others to prove my conviction to God's truth. Which is which is untrue, because really condemning is God's job. Teaching and modeling Christ likeness is our job. Christ likeness is our job. Conviction is the Holy Spirit's job. Condemning is the Father's job. It's not it's not your responsibility. But religious Christianity says if you don't condemn those who are not perfectly in alignment with what you believe, you have fallen from the faith. Watch this, which is arrogant in itself because it assumes that you and I are perfect. It assumes that we know exactly, you know, which the Bible says the scriptures is of no private interpretation. I frankly believe that a lot of us are going to get to heaven and find out things we were completely and totally committed to were unnecessary or untrue. The truth is this. The truth itself is not an end in itself. The end of truth is deliverance. So back to my previous statement, the religious persuasion of Christianity is that we must condemn others to prove our conviction to God's truth, but the truth itself is not an end in itself. The end of truth is deliverance. But if, if truth does not have an object to save or deliver, truth then becomes irrelevant or unnecessary. Now, the truth does not need a defender, but it does need a carrier or a host to bring it to where it may have its greatest effect. You see, we are, you and I as the sons and daughters of God, we are the standard bearers. Yes, we are. We're supposed to live our lives in the world like Christ would have us to live our lives. But that means we carry truth to a lost and to a confused world. But if you cannot embrace people, you will never deliver truth. And if you can never deliver truth, you will never influence them. You'll never embrace a people you, uh, influence a people you cannot embrace. And so we sit with our, you know, in our glass houses of condemnation, with hands full of stones, not understanding that God never called us just to camp out on Sundays with one another. He, he, he didn't call us. We view church services on Sunday almost like a social club. And the reality is 
God calls us together, number one, to worship him, number two, to edify and to encourage one another to go back into the world, to what, embrace the world, but you can't embrace a world you can't tolerate. I tell this story all the time. You know, if, if the world makes you sick, you will be of no use to God. If, 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 if you can't, if you can't stomach homosexuals, and I do believe the biblical model of man and woman, one man, one woman for life, I really do believe that. But if, if I can't stand to be around homosexuals, and if I can't, you know, sincerely love them with the love of Christ, if I can't have a conversation with them, if I can't sit with them and talk with them, how will I ever deliver truth to them? And if they can sense my intolerable energy, how will I ever have influence with them? I was in a store many, many years ago, and, and I, I had this, uh, this particular cologne that I was wearing. Um, I forget what kind it was, but I was wearing it and I love very, very loud fragrances. So if you ever, you know, smell somebody coming, it's probably me. I love very, very loud fragrances. And um in fact it was a Cartier fragrance. And 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 so I'm in the store and I'm in the line. I'm about three or four persons back, and I'm noticing the cashier, the young lady is beginning to cough and she's beginning to sneeze and she's rubbing her eyes. And so one person moves on, another person moves on. And then finally she, she looks at me because as I get closer, her symptoms are getting worse. Finally, she looks at me and she says, sir, sir, could you please back up? Could you please back up? I said, why? She said, your, 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 your cologne it, it, it's getting to me. I just, I just can't take it. I'm allergic. Please back up. And all I could do was laugh because my cologne was making her sick. Well, if the world makes you sick, you will never be able to get close enough to serve them. Listen to what the Bible says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. For though I free, though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them. I'm tolerating everybody on their level. He says in verse 21, to them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I, I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. You see, tolerance is not condoning behavior. It is affirming your love and acceptance of people while Holy Spirit does the transforming. Just find the level that, that people are on and, and, and get in where you fit in. Love them where you love them where they are. It does not mean that you, you condone or you subscribe to their beliefs, but it does mean that you share the love of Christ with them through your embrace. You see, people don't need and many times don't even expect us to agree with all of their behavior, but they do need to know we love them in our disagreements. I was just thinking about parenting and and in particular parenting grown children. Um 
your your grown children are going to make life decisions many times that go against your values, your convictions, and you're going to be challenged with your grown children to separate your approval of their behavior from your love for them as your child. And they don't need you to necessarily agree with the choices they've made, but they do need to know that you love them in spite of your disagreements. And so it is with the world. Listen to what the Bible says in Ephesians 4.15. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. But somewhere we've been conditioned to believe that we must hate sinners to love God. Let me say that one more time. Somewhere, somebody convinced us to believe that the only way we can love God is to hate sinners. So there are three things that I... I want us to look at today as I have pondered this thing called tolerance. Number one, let's look at loving versus approving. There's a difference between loving. We just kind of alluded to it with the analogy about parenting and grown children. Your grown children make decisions all the time that you can't approve of, not in good conscience, but it never impacts your love for them. You know, I was, um, I was a teenage father and I, even after that, I, I lived my life recklessly and my mother and my father never approved of my behavior. They never approved of my behavior, but they always loved me. Even when, even when Mom was pointing her finger at me and saying, Bob, you got to get your life together. You better get yourself together. God's not pleased with you, Bob. I never doubted my mother's love for me. And I think as believers, we have to understand that our disapproval of the way people live should never impact our, the love we give. The way people live should never change the love we give. If you go to Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and uh, 10, it says, But God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. But notice, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, we were not in a state or a place that God approved of. But God sent his love to us. You know why? Because the only way for God to transition us from a place of disapproval was to send his love. He had to become what we were. That was what Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us without sin, that he might be able to redeem us and make us again the sons and daughters of God. But but look at the difference between love versus approval. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He sent God, the Father sent his love toward us. You see, God loved us because he disapproved. Yeah, God God loved us first because he disapproved. His love was the only means of transforming us. And I know that you you see people and, and, and you hear things and people live their lives a certain kind of way and you don't approve of that. But the reality is it is in your mouth, the word of salvation. 
If you can't tolerate them enough to have a conversation, where goes their salvation? Your your love for them uh, should push you towards them because you disapprove of the direction they're going in. The lame cannot come to the paramedic. The paramedic must go to the injured. The paramedic cannot be of any use if he feels it immoral or sacrilegious to communicate with or to interact with the injured. So I would make a horrible, horrible paramedic. I would make a miserable doctor. In fact, I would never, I would never make it because I can't stand the sight of blood. What good would I be in a trauma center if I can't tolerate blood? What use are my gifts that, that I have to give to the world? How can I save lives if I can't tolerate? How can you win the world? If you hate the world, because religion made you believe that you got to hate people to love God. There's so much hate in the church today. Come on now. Come on now. There was a time, man, because of the era I came up in that, you know, if if there was um, a person that that just seemed to be gay. If there was an effeminate man, oh man, we would spend, you know, three fourths of the sermon talking, making homosexual jokes, and 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 and, you know, just just making these statements that the crowd would roar to. Now, mm-mm. that ain't the way Jesus did it. That ain't the way, that's not the way Jesus did it. We we have to learn how to separate our love from our approval. Just because I disapprove, it has absolutely nothing to do with my love for you. So as as a Christian, as a man that's saved and lived by the book, come on now. I can say to you, your lifestyle is against the word of God. It is not right. And then say, now let's go sit down and have lunch. I've done it. I've done it. And you know what? When I when I love them, they are drawn to me. When I say them, I'm not just speaking of homosexuals. I mean, people of all different kinds of, uh, you know, issues and vices. When they know that they're loved, their ears open, their hearts open. Now, now the second thing I want to deal with is insulated versus isolated. Because right now, this intolerance we have is isolating us from the world. Because some of y'all can't fathom. You just, you know, even, even when I just said that I can, I can tell a homosexual, you know, your lifestyle is against the word of God and, you know, so forth and so on. And and then at the same time, say to them right behind that statement, come on, let's go sit down. Let's have lunch. Let's talk, you know, and we ain't got to talk about the Bible. We ain't got to talk about their lifestyle. We may talk about sports. We may talk about whatever, 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 because this church has, see, a lot of you got challenge with that because this church has convinced you that the only way to be righteous is to be isolated from the world. How can you change a world you can't embrace? Religion makes us conclude that devotion to Christ is condemnation of culture. Though our convictions are never to vacillate or to compromise, our wisdom positions us in striking range and within the sphere of influence of the world. The church ain't showing up in the world because the church has been conditioned through toxic religion. Oh, you can't be in the middle of that. 
You can't put yourself in the Some of y'all can't even go to family reunion because they're drinking over there. Man, what is wrong with you? You, you, you got a serious problem. You go to restaurants and they're drinking? Look at the hypocrisy there. I just messed you up. You can't go to family reunion because they're drinking. And you go to restaurants all the time where folk are drunk. That's your religion that has isolated you. And you don't understand that God never called us to be isolated from the world, but rather to be insulated in the world. You, you, you're not of space. The, 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 the astronauts are not of space, but they go and get in space because they put on their space suits that allow them to function in the atmosphere because they are what? Insulated. God never called you to be isolated. If you don't have enough Holy Ghost in you that you, can, you can't go to a family reunion because somebody's drinking, babe, you ain't got much. Listen to what the Bible says in John 17, verses 14 through 16. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Many what? Publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth, because you don't have a clue. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I have given them thy word, and the world hath healed, hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Insulate them, don't isolate them. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Jesus never called you to be isolated. Jesus called you to be insulated. He said, don't take them out of the world. The world hates them, but don't take them out of the world. Leave them in the world. Just insulate them. Keep them. Keep them. And then the third thing I want to deal with, and then I'm done. I think I've gotten into enough good trouble today. Are you going to shine on the table? Or are you going to shine under the table? I got lights on right now. If I, if I did not, I would not be able to even be talking to you right now. I would not be able to film this. But if the light were hidden under the desk, what good would it do my process? You see, you and I are, listen to what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. He says, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden on the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world, the city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Ultimately, God has commissioned us to bring light to the world, to be the salt of the earth. Now, you can't be sold unless you're, you're willing to get in, get in there. <laughs> you can't, you can't, salt is ineffective until it fully immerses itself into the dish, the item or the object of its gift. Salt can't do a roast no good sitting on the counter. Salt can't do any beans any good sitting in the cupboard. 
You got you to gotta get in there. A light can't do a room any good sitting under a desk. A light can't do a space any good sitting under a bush. But you got to put it on a candlestick so that it can what? Give light to the whole room. In other words, take that light and, and sit it right in the middle of all of the darkness and watch the light transform the darkness. I've never seen darkness overcome light. Light always overcomes darkness. You and I have to understand that the darkness of this world is no match for the light that is in our hearts. We got to learn to love people. We got to understand that loving people does not mean we condone their behavior. We have to also understand that we are the answer to people's real problem. People are in the condition they're in because they're searching for the real answer. We are the ones that contain that answer. We, we are the standard bearers. We are the carriers of truth. Well, we got to bring that truth to the people who need it. Away, enough with all of this religion that makes us feel like we can't embrace people, we can't love people, that to love God means to hate people, that we have to always be in a posture where we're condemning people. You don't have to condemn people. Let All you got to do is love people, speak the truth in love, and allow the Holy Spirit to bring conviction. As some of you whose children are way off the track, you don't have to remind them every time you talk to them that you're disappointed in them and that the life they're living is, is not of God. All you got to do is keep that bridge and keep loving them, keep being the light, and keep praying for them. Sometimes you got to be quiet for them to hear God. Sometimes you got to shut up so they can really hear God. And when you shut up, you'll be amazed at how one day they'll come and kneel at your bedside and say, you know, Ma, I finally got it now. I see what you were saying. I understand. I want Jesus to come into my heart and be Lord of my life. Because God is calling us in this day and time, especially in this generation. He's calling us to a place of righteous tolerance righteous tolerance. Now you may be there and you may be saying, well, pastor, I need to be saved. I want to give my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. This invitation is for you. Secondly, you may be here and you may be saying, well, pastor, I just want to join New Home Church or I want to join the cyber church community. New Home Church exists in a number of locations. You can be a part of the physical assembly. We have our Headquarters Church at 1616 Robert C. Blake Sr. Drive in New Orleans. We have our East New Orleans campus at 13800 Hain Boulevard. Our, our Baton Rouge campus at uh, 3000 Tecumseh. Our Hammond, Louisiana campus at, uh, I think, 1300 Martin Luther King. And we have our Houston, Texas campus at 4805 Shermire Road. I want you to follow the email address that's on the screen. It's not on the screen, it's in the description. And whatever your need is, someone's going to respond to you, to pray with you and to help you to get situated. If it's joining the church, if it's accepting Christ, if it's becoming a part of the cyber church community, someone's going to assist you. Now, today as we prepare to honor God in our giving, I sense that there are some of you that are watching me right now You've been praying about something very specific for a few days now, all this week, maybe even weeks. You've been praying about something, not just in general, but about something specific that you really need to see God do. I don't know if it's a, if it's a health condition. I don't know if it's a legal situation, if it's a job situation. I don't know what it is, but it's something very specific. I want you today, if you feel the witness of the Holy Spirit, only if you feel the witness of the Holy Spirit, and please understand, I am not asking you to give to me. I have to always say that because we always have people that, you know, they, they make a lot of bogus comments. I'm never asking you to give to me. I'm never asking you to tithe to me. It's to the church that I happen to pastor. It's to the church. If you're there and you're saying, well, pastor, I'm that person. I really 
have need of something very specific that's troubling me, that's, that's concerning me at least. I'm led to ask you to sow a $156 seed only if you have it and only if you're willing. I'm not asking you to pull from your bill money. That, that's not the purpose of this. I want you to give at your level. But there's some of you that the Lord has blessed you to have it. And the Holy Spirit will, he will put a witness in your heart that this is for you. You will have a complete and total peace about it and you will give it cheerfully. I remember when God challenged me to give, man, and he's done, done it a number of times. And I was giving for something specific. Right now, I'm still sowing for something specific that I need God to do that only God can do. Man can't do it. It's beyond the scope of man's ability. But if you're there and you're saying, Pastor, I feel that word, I feel that, and I feel it's for me, I, I speak faith into your life right now. And as you prepare to sow this uncommon seed, Holy Spirit, I thank you for giving me the prophetic revelation of it and allowing them to have the witness in their own hearts, the confirmation of it, and the obedience to follow your lead. Now I say in the name of Jesus Christ that everything they sow this seed in purpose, every purpose that this seed is sown for will produce and manifest. And testimonies will come of miracles happening. Come on now. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Now, that's out of the way. Those of you that are participating in just the regular tithes and offerings, I want you to prepare the Lord's tithe. If you're not a tither, I suggest you begin to try God today as he asked you in Malachi to prove me, test me, try me, see if I won't open you the windows of heaven. Bring me the dime off of every dollar and see what, I'll, see what I won't do for you. And then I'm asking everyone as a corporate seed to sow a $56 seed into New Home Church today. All of the giving apparatuses are on the screen or in the description. All of the giving apparatuses are on the screen or the links are in the description. I want you to sow. I want you to tithe today in Jesus' name. I want everyone that is anywhere around the Houston, Texas area to meet me this morning. This morning. I want to see you in the house. Relax yourself. Come, you know, chill just like I am. Just come. Just, you know, don't worry about it. You ain't got to put on no suit and tie. Come in your jeans and your tennis shoes. Lisa and I are having a conversation on the stage about relationships. I want you to make it in and get in on time because we're going to try to do it and uh, have a brief Q&A following our discussion. And we're on a schedule because we, the congregation, we're going to see, uh, what is it, uh, Wakanda 2 or something like that, just as a fellowship. I love you all. I want you to know I'll see you in New Orleans first Sunday. I'm excited. The Lord is going to do a new thing. We're getting ready to wind this year down. First Sunday is going to be the the first Sunday of the last month of this year. I want you to get ready to meet me in New Orleans. It's going to be off of, the children don't like me to say that, off of the chain. It's, it's not off of the chain, it's off the chain. It's going to be off of the chain first Sunday. God bless you, my babies. I love you. You're on top and you're going higher. God is more in store for you. So we will see you at the We here at R.C. Blake's Ministries want to thank you for spending this time with us today. R.C. and Lisa are always honored to have you with us. Don't forget to reach out to us by visiting our website at www.rcblakes.com. While you're there, you may join our mailing list and receive a free download of the Laws of Manifesting Your Vision by R.C. Blakes. Also look at all of the online programs by R.C. You may find all books written by R.C. and Lisa. Once again, all of us here at R.C. Blake's Ministries want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And as we always say, see you at the top.